put the recording on also. So, yeah, now we can see. You can see the screen, right? I'm going to. So I can see it. I can see it. Yes. Shall we start then? Okay. All right. So. The screen. Yes, we can see the presentation mode of your screen. Okay. Um, hello, all. Uh, welcome to the CMI Data Science Seminar. Uh, today we have uh, Balaji Raman from Cogitas. Uh, Balaji and I went to long back to our PhD times together in University of Connecticut. We almost 90% uh, overlapping with of time. A uh, little bit, you know, you join little late and uh, maybe a semester late probably, and then you also graduated semester late, I think. But uh, since then, then he worked in Yale University for briefly, and then he also uh, came back to India, and now uh, he is working with Cogitas for a long time, I think more than nine years or 10 years? Yeah, it's eight years now. Yeah. Eight years now, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so I would not uh, spend any more time. So Bala, it's to you. Uh, Bala is today going to talk about marketing, uh, yet another playground for data scientists. So Bala ji, please, it's your. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sarish. Thanks for the wonderful uh, introduction. And also thank you for inviting me for presenting uh, this data science seminar. So and and I mean, so yeah. Good afternoon, everyone here. And as uh, Southish said, so we go long back. So I know mean, Southish for almost for 15 plus years now. Uh, been a friend and a mentor to me for a long time, and continues to uh, be so. So he went to Yukon. I followed him there, and then he came to Pune. I followed him there. But now he's in Chennai. I wish I can come to Chennai. That's my uh, hometown. Uh, let's see. So uh, having said this, let me. Uh, uh, give you a brief introduction about the company where I work. So I work for Kojita's AB. This is based in Mumbai. Uh, what we do, so the, our company is a consulting firm and we work in this area of marketing and uh, data science, right? The confluence of marketing and data science. So that's, that's, that's the field in which we work. And in this particular talk, I'm going to uh, take you through a few examples which we have worked. I mean, I'm saying examples that are actually case studies. Uh, it's a business problems which the clients for whom we work, they had. And I'm going to uh, take you to the solutions and then how the solutions benefit to the client, right? Uh, so, yeah, so that, that's that's what this talk is going to be. And uh, before that, I just wanted to give an introduction of what marketing is about. So because different people might be thinking different things about marketing, let's try to understand what we, I mean, when, when we say marketing from our uh, company, do what marketing is, right? So I'm going to start with a very simple question. So most of you are students, CMI, and you will either be graduating now or maybe graduating a year from now, and you'll all be very keen to work in companies, right? Now imagine a situation where uh, there are so many companies queued up to uh, recruit you all, right? And then you guys are all given an option. So your placement coordinator, he tells you, now, come on, you name a company that you would like to work for, right? If that is the question which is posed to you, then you will come up with so many companies, right? You will say, oh, I want to work for this. I want to work for company A, company B, and so on. But I'm just giving you a small uh, list of companies, right? Maybe you want to go for, work for Google, Facebook, Mercedes Benz, maybe some, I mean, I'm hoping after this talk, some will also say, I want to work for Tojitas, but until then, uh, it's all going to be all these uh, uh, bigger companies, right? So I'm, I'm sure some of these companies must be in your mind also. But the question is, uh, so why do you think you want to work for these companies, right? Or what makes you think you want to work for these companies? So for example, if you take Google as an example, uh, you may feel, you know, they, the research is pretty good. I have read a couple of research papers uh, from Google and I, I like the work they do. Or you might be quite excited with all the big data work which they do. They work a lot on TensorFlow, they work a lot on Keras, and or, or could also might be a case where you know what, I like the culture out there. I like the free food which they give here, and that's what and that's the reason why I want to work for Google, right? So you can have any number of reasons, but it is difficult to pinpoint to say what made you to come up with these reasons. So now 
maybe you might have seen people working there you might have read about something which google has posted online so it's either word of mouth or reading something and so on so you have formed your opinion or your perception of each of these companies right and these opinions are formed because of certain activities done by the company or or to or, or to simplify it i'm going to call these as brands right i'm going to so google is a brand facebook is a brand flipkart is a brand and so on so these two, so some activity is carried out by the company and because of that you have a certain perception in your mind so this exactly this is what we mean by marketing right so the companies are doing certain activities so i mean it's tough to say what those activities are there are n number of activities and the collection of all these activities has made you to form a perception or form opinion about each of these brands so now the set of all these activities together and that's what i'm going to call as marketing right so so as i said uh, the perception of marketing is going to differ by individual and and also uh, marketing is such a topic where there is no one definition so uh, uh, i may think these are meant for me a definition of marketing could be different from what you guys think so uh, it could it could vary by percent to percent and uh, remember it's not only these companies or brands that market themselves it's also us right people like you and me so students you also do marketing you also try to market yourself for example when you go for an interview you have your resume and your resume is going to say i know this i know that i have done this i have done that so that's a kind of marketing and in fact even you take your faculty members proposal this also a marketing component part of uh, their work because you go to the website you look at their profile uh, so you know look at the research papers which you have done you look at all the awards and honors and all and all sorts of things right so these are all different different or small small marketing activities and uh, and the other of course I mean, even 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 politicians also market for i don't really want to get into that and marketing is what sells right uh, on a on a lighter note so i must i mean statisticians or issues and those are kind of details also so you know what uh, machine learning or data science that's that's uh, that's they are the bus was these days and lot more popular than uh, let's say saying statistics right this is on Like that, right? <clears throat> so, so I mean, this is what we mean by marketing, or in the different kind of perceptions which you have. So, it's a very abstract, it's very creative field, right? And it's very creative, and this marketing is very, very an abstract notion. And hence, it becomes very difficult to measure it analytically, right? So now, when you say, let's say, you have an opinion, or you have a person of Google, and if Google wants to evaluate that, right? it's going to be very difficult because different consumers are going to have different sorts of opinion about it it's not like when you do a simple sales or finance where you have something known as return on investment which means you know i have spent 100 rupees 100 rupees uh, to do this particular activity or to sell this particular product and what is the return i'm getting if i'm getting a return yeah good i made some profit so it's very simple uh, even a simple arithmetic completion can tell us but in marketing it's very very difficult to do and let's say for example if you have some marketing activity and then you try to convert into a sales and then you uh, you have a metric or return on investment and go back and tell the firm you know this activity has resulted in so and so impact so you will see some pushback because uh, they will say uh, this campaign had an intention only to create the uh, awareness and not necessarily for sales right so there's usually a pushback when it comes to marketing analytics by this uh, the marketing stakeholders of uh, companies but that but that doesn't mean that uh, there is no science to uh, uh, this marketing activity which we have so marketing science is a, it's a field is a domain it's it's a flourishing research field and uh, you have serious uh, good uh, amount of work uh, being done in this field but when it comes when it comes to companies the acceptance rate is really uh, low so now we as a company work on this particular domain we work on this type of marketing activity and we have worked for a lot of fmcg firms uh, when i say fmcg these are companies like unilever which sells your your shampoos and soaps or your britannia and the skills kellogg's and so on and so we have we have worked for fmcg firms we work for pharma we work for media firms and so on and in all these cases we are our our work is in this domain of marketing 
and uh, we go back and tell them some strategies for what are problems we have and everything is based on uh, statistical modeling or maybe uh, to make it more fashionable data science right so now these are a uh, few problems which i am uh, mentioned out here which uh, we do for these companies in the speed of marketing and also maybe we can add sales also to this uh, starting with something simple as the pricing curve. So what does it mean? So imagine you have a bottle of shampoo and then you are, uh, you as a company, you manufacture the shampoo and you are wondering whether to increase the price of the shampoo. Let's say if it is, uh, if it's about 50 rupees, then you are thinking maybe can I increase the price by 10% or should I increase the price by 5%, right? The question is really simple. But then when you increase your price, there's going to be a lot more impacts to it, right? So then how much you have to spend on media, then what happens if my competition reduces the price? So then all my consumers probably will shift to my competition, then my market share will come down. So there are a lot of things which one has to look at before uh, taking a simple decision. As a simple decision is a 5% increase in price, right? And in this talk, I'm going to specifically talk about these two uh, use cases. One is this brand equity, where we'll see what it means and what we have done over here and something called advertisement effectiveness, right? And similarly, there are also work on promotions. Again, taking uh, shampoo as an example, let's say sometimes when you go to a shop and buy, in, I mean, when you buy a bottle of shampoo, sometimes you get a 20% off, or you get a one, buy one bottle, get one bottle free, and so on. But end of the day, the company would like to know, I'm giving all these different types of promotions, and which one is actually working? Which one is actually helping me to increase my seats, right? That's what we mean by promotion effectiveness. And uh, we also done work on uh, selecting spots for ads because um, uh, let's say you, again, you, you want to put your advertisement in your, let's say example, a, a TV channel, and then where do you want to uh, uh, put your ads on? So should I put it on a weekday or should I put it on a weekend? Should it be a prime time? Should it be on sports and all these uh, uh, different genres which there, which there are. So, and then, and then typically we also work for fighting competition. You know what, my competitor has, has increased his media budgets, has slashed your prices drastically. What should we do and how do we fight the competition? So these are uh, typically the list of problems which uh, we work. And these are some of the companies where we have uh, done our uh, the marketing analytics work and uh, given our recommendations. Right? And so this is a, a brief background on marketing and the type of work which we do. So now I'm I'm going to be more specific from now. I'm going to talk about two use cases, and the uh, the first one is on this brand equity and its right. So we will see what brand equity means. I'll also discuss and also take you through all uh, the meaning of the, uh, the brand equity drivers and so on. So uh, before that, let me give you a background. So this is going to tell you for whom we work and what was the problem faced by the company and so on. So we worked for an e-commerce marketplace in India, right? So now you have so many companies in this e-commerce domain. This was uh, some few years back. Um, so this particular firm had a very limited media budget, right? And its competition, they had uh, deep pockets. For example, if this particular company is uh, spending some X amount of dollars, the uh, the competitors would be spending somewhere between five times to six times of whatever their budget was. Right? So that was, was significantly uh, huge. But and this company during our festive season, right? They were when when you say festive season, usually in India, people say so that's Navratri, Diwali. So that's that's the uh, the festive season uh, typically in, in India. So during this time, they're going to come up with a new advertisement campaign, right? And then. Uh, so that the, they had, they already made the plans, and then that's when they had called us to uh, find out what impact would these advertisement from the new campaign would have on the brand equity, right? And then they also want to know what is driving their brand equity. So what are the different uh, imagery statements or attributes that are driving the brand equity, right? So now, what do you mean by brand equity? It's nothing but uh, the perception which you and I have about certain brands, right? So that's that's uh, uh, that's some perception, and then we are trying to quantify that particular perception. So this is not something new. Uh, this is an uh, this very traditional uh, uh, work in uh, marketing. So every company will have some idea of uh, brand equity and some some different types of methods which they do. But when at least in our company, we 
staunchly feel that when we talk about brand equity, it always has to be linked to a metric which is dependent on sales, right? And why sales? Because that is something which you know has happened. For example, it's not like, let's say, if somebody says, what do you think about Mercedes Benz? I say, oh, it's a wonderful car. It's a wonderful brand. But are you going to buy it? Are you going to use it? I mean, probably no, right? So so that's why we, we as a company, we try to link this uh, sales uh, to brand equity. So all the notions of brand equity, the perception, and we try to capture this perception through what has happened, in, uh, in, which is nothing but sales. Right? <clears throat> but I've been talking about media and all. So now it's also important to know why do brands advertise, right? So what is the need for the brands? Right? Uh, so the, the, the main purpose is to create awareness, right? So the, you may, for example, you would have seen all these uh, ads on uh, Dream11, right? The Dhoni used to be the brand ambassador, probably is still now the brand ambassador. And then you have so many other players and then it, it's, a, it's a fantasy app. I mean, uh, you, 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 it's a fantasy uh, app, right? You, you create your team and then you see and then you're going to compete with some, within some uh, circle, right? So this has become extremely popular now, but imagine when, you, when they started off with the team level ad, it had taken some time for them to establish probably the probably the number one uh, fantasy uh, league going on. And then you have these uh, advertisements for White Hand Junior, right? So sometimes looking at those ads of White Hand Junior might make you wonder, is it better is, should you spend time uh, learning coding in CMI or maybe learn coding from White Hand Junior? So, so uh, again, a classic example is Paytm. So now Paytm is very well embedded, uh, let's say, in each of uh, our minds, right? If we mobile payment, we probably go with Paytm or phone pay or one of these ads. But let's say about some six, seven years back, if we had, if somebody had mentioned about Paytm, it would have been something new to us, right? So, so what, what these companies do with these ads is they are trying to create an awareness, and that awareness finally would lead the consumer to use that particular brand, right, or use their product to purchase the product, whatever. So that is the main. <clears throat> Goal for all these brands to advertise. Right? So when I was, uh, let me take KTM again as an example. Um, so in this in this marketing, there are something known as funnels and pyramids. So I'm going to first talk about this pyramid called awareness pyramid. So earlier we were all we didn't know about this brand called KTM, and then with that with the ads, for example, the KTM Pro, right, that became really popular. And then next time, when someone talks about a mobile payment, or you see some a uh, logo of Paytm, you are able to recognize it. And then after, let's say, after a few months down the line, if someone says that it is something called a mobile wallet, you know, you know, it's now easier for it to recall. So yeah, yeah, I know about a, I know about uh, a brand called Paytm. And then slowly, it's going to establish itself as a top of mind. So I'm just giving you an example for Paytm. It could this this could be in any other uh, domain. For example, you're going to you're going to purchase a mobile phone. There'll be let's say which phone you want to buy. There's the brand which is safer. That's going to be the top of mind, right? A few years back, you may probably not even be uh, thinking about it. So there is a proper journal from being unaware of the brand to being uh, the brand being the top of your mind. And this awareness pyramid, it's now going to help the uh, brand in something known as a purchasing funnel. So you are aware of the brand, and then. And the next step would be when you're making a purchase, you may probably consider that particular brand also. Now, I may, I may let's say, for example, if I'm buying a phone, I may maybe Samsung or Oppo would be one of my uh, uh, brands under consideration. And then there's this particular push, right, from consideration to usage. And then you become a loyal consumer of this particular brand. So that is that is the aim for all these uh, brands to advertise. Right? So now. So now we know what a brand equity is, and we now know why our media companies also advertise. Now then we went back to the firm, and then uh, we were very clear about the question which they had. They said we want to measure this brand equity of our brand and also of competition. Right. So this was the task, <laughs> and uh, the one if you look at this line, it says brand equity score. It's a combination of awareness and usage metrics. This is something well established in marketing. This is not, uh, this is nothing new. So, uh, so uh, people in marketing always know this brand equity is some combination of awareness and usage metrics. And next thing, awareness, it is going to be where you're top of mind and brand recall and so on. 
and usage could be a combination of consideration, usage, and all. So then we again ask the uh, client to see what kind of data do you have for this analysis to be carried out. You now, what do we need? And I said we usually work with sales data. Right? And then companies said, you know what, sales, yes, we have it. Uh, we, we have the number of people listing on our website. We have the total sales for uh, each week, each month, and so on. So that we have. But when we have to look at brand equity, it's not about the brand for whom we are working, right? You also, you also have to compare it with the competition to understand where you uh, fall in line, right? Then we asked them, do you have data for the competition? And they said, no. So uh, that was not available. And, and, and typically, at least in FMCG domains, when I talk about companies like Indy, Procter & Gamble and all, uh, there are third-party agencies who collect such sales data. And, and so therefore, you have it for all your um, different brands and competition. It's easy to work with. But in this particular case, the, 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 our client said, we don't have data on uh, sales for competition. Okay, then we're wondering what, uh, what else do we have? So media, yes, we had. Uh, so for them, so then also for the competition, because this is all done by a third party um, agency. So when I say third party, it has nothing to do with us and it has nothing to do with the client who we are working for. But typically, there are certain media agencies who collect such data. So they will know um, how much money they have each of these brands have spent uh, per week and, uh, and, uh, and how many people have viewed it and so on. So that, that metric is there. And in addition to this media, there is another type of data which is usually available, which is you know, it's a brand tracker. And this is what is also quite useful to us. So now this brand track is nothing but uh, a data obtained from surveys. So uh, so you have respondents, and this is again done by external firm. So the way you select respondents is all based on proper sampling scheme. If you ask me how, I, mean, I, I actually don't have an idea because it's, it's a very different um, piece of work and we are not involved with that. And so these companies go and uh, conduct surveys and um, they, they ask consumer surveys, I mean, they ask consumers questions on awareness, let's say, again, if I gave an example of a phone or a mobile payment app and so on. And then, for example, I'm, I listed the set of questions here. Since you're working for this e-commerce um, domain, so one question was, what do you think, when you think of online shopping websites, which all sites come to your mind? So this is about your uh, awareness. And then when you look at this question, how likely you are to shop on these websites, this is about consideration. And then finally, they have, there are something called imagery statements, which means, for example, if since we're talking about an e-commerce form, so when we, uh, uh, let's say you and I are going to purchase something from e-commerce, there will be certain certain attributes which we have in mind and which we're trying to express from uh, based on the survey. What about the return process? I mean, uh, does this particular brand has a faster shipping? Do they offer better deals and so on, right? So these are different uh, statements posed in this survey. And these statements are usually known as imagery statements because they are trying to um, um, extract the perception which we have about the different brands, right? And that, that's exactly the goal which we want. We want to know what the brand equity score is. And at the same time, what are those drivers behind these brand equity scores? So the drivers are nothing but all these different imagery statements. So we didn't have this data for competition. So then we were again, we didn't know, we were wondering what to do. And while we were discussing in-house, then suddenly one of uh, a team of us uh, said, so why didn't we use Google Trends data? So we were wondering, how do you link Google Trends data to sales data? So as a simple exercise, we Google Trends are nothing but the search terms, right? Now let's say if you're talking when you talk about a brand, you type the name of the brand, you have your you have your time series um, data of search, search trend, right? That that data we were able to extract. And then when we looked for the focal brand, because for this focal brand, we also had sales data and we extracted this Google Trends data. And then when we looked at the correlation, the correlation was pretty high. So we had about um, 70 percent of uh, correlation. Then the idea was why can't we use this Google Trends as a proxy? So we don't have sales for the competition. And we find this high correlation between the Google Trends uh, search and also the focal brands. So we are now extrapolating it, right? So now why don't we use this as a proxy for uh, sales data? And that's what we did, right? So 
then we looked at the um, Google Trends data for about uh, seven brands. Um, uh, because the seven brands were almost as good as a category. When I say category, these are the set of all e-commerce uh, marketplace companies in India. At the time when we were working on this particular project, we had about, about nine to ten firms, but then about seven firms are almost, almost contributing to 90-90% of the total uh, volume six. Right. So therefore, we could get on, uh, we could obtain all these uh, uh, Google Trends data, and then we used uh, some simple, I mean, the response is again is going to be in person, we use some uh, logic transform, and then the first task was to get this brand equity. So we just want to know what was contributing to this brand equity score. Therefore, at the category level, for this e-commerce category, we found these two uh, uh, metrics, which is spontaneous and conservation, to be the key players, right? And then the weightage where 60% for spontaneous and 40% for conservation, right? Among all the different awareness metrics and usage metrics, these two turned out to be the more let me try the significant ones. Okay. And using this as a weightage, then for each brand, we were able to evaluate their brand equity score, right? Because we have it, we got it for the category. Now we're going to evaluate for different brands. So after doing this, so what did we see for our uh, particular focal brand? Let's say this this particular, you, you can focus on, this, focus on this orange bar chart, right? In 2015, at the time when we were working on it, we found the score was 60. But then if you look at the competition, I mean, uh, competition A and competition B, that's what we call it here, they were quite tight, right? With competition A 66 and competition B was 79. So now the company understood where they were in terms of uh, uh, perception, by the consumers, right? And then they're also able to compare themselves with um, their competition, right? But again, the key question was, we are doing this great campaign, which, which we think is going to work really well. So that was the hypothesis. So the hypothesis, what this particular campaign, uh, which we're going to run during the festive season is going to help us increase the uh, equity score. And they were right. So the hypothesis in fact was right. So what we did after this campaign was done, after a couple of months, we again did the same same exercise and we found there the brand equity score had gone up by about 12%. So the company was glad to know that at least uh, whatever media campaign they have, they have done so far has been helping them. So this is one part of the question that should be an answer. We're able to understand what the brand equity is. And then yes, we told them your media company is working well. And then the second question was, so now among all these uh, imagery statements, right, which is actually driving our brand equity score. This is quite important for the uh, companies to understand. And the reason to why it is important, I, I'm going to come to talk about it in the next uh, slide or so. So now this is the kind of data, what we have for the imagery statements. I think we have statements for, we have some scores for each week and, uh, and, and, and recall this has been collected from surveys, right? This has been collected from um, um, market surveys. So now again, e-commerce, these are, these are different kinds of statements, which even we wonder whether, uh, and we probably when we can, uh, let's say if you want to ask about uh, any company in the e-commerce uh, domain, even we would probably associate some score to them, right? So that's exactly what we have. So now as the brand, we have the latest range of products, it has faster shipping or delivery and easy return on return. So we, we put some scores to it. Now, we already have this brand equity score from our this particular method. So now we use this brand equity score which we have for weekly or monthly as our response variable, right? Because we know there's nothing but an weighted average of your spontaneous and your, I mean, your conservation and uh, usage. So that's going to be a response variable. And then you have more another what you know, some 20, 25 statements. And there are various methods to do it. We applied a lasso method because we also want to do the variable selection and we have to go back and tell them you know, these are the three, four attributes that are driving your brand. So that's 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 the reason why we went for uh, uh, a lasso type of method. And then what did we find? So so uh, so this is where, let's say, a modeling, and then you have to transform this modeling into uh, some sort of a meaningful way to convey the results to clients, right? Now, so this is actually, I mean, something that is usually a tough part, it's actually a challenging part, that's what uh, I need to say. 
um, if you, in fact, as an exercise, probably you all must know about logistic regression, right? Now, let's say if you want to explain the results from a logistic regression to uh, to uh, persons who don't know what logistic regression, let's say you take an example, let's say you have a friend from your marketing or working on in uh, some companies and then trying to explain them this, uh, this meaning of logistic regression. And then you think you know about this method, but the once you start explaining them in very simple lean terms, and you, you will really find it uh, challenging. Okay. So finally, we had to go back to the client and tell them in some sort of uh, way. So we came up with a pyramid type of an approach. So we first said them, you know, you have your money, you have some attributes working well for you. Similarly, competitors also have attributes working well for them. So now this base or this pyramid is what we say as a hygiene attributes or attributes common with one or more competitors. Right, so latest change of products, faster shipping, and blah blah blah, and so on. Right now, the top of the pyramid is nothing but a set of attributes that actually distinguishes you from your competition. So, this is important for the client to know why right? because now they can focus on this attribute a lot, right? And it's also important for the client to understand this one, right? Which is the, the attributes are common with one or more competitors. So now the focus will be to improve the scores in this, right? So uh, they can see what the scores are, for example, faster shipping and delivery. If you take as a statement, you can, you can compare where do they stand with the respect to uh, the competition. And then they can now try to think of ways to probably increase or push the scores for this particular image statement, right? And that's exactly what we go into this front. So, so, and how they benefited from this exercise? So uh, they now had a good handle on what consumers perceive about their brand. And then they were, even with a limited media budget, they were able to focus on attributes which are going to help in driving their brand equity and also focus on uh, attributes and then form the media strategy across attributes, which is going to distinguish them from the, um, the competition. Right? So this is, this is our, uh, our first piece. Um, so, in a summary, it's a from e commerce form. So, we had to look at what are the brand equity and the impact of media on brand equity, and also the um, uh, and what are the attributes which are affecting the brand equity score. Okay, this is what we did for an e commerce form. And then, I mean, now if you have any questions, you can ask me. If not, we can also wait till the end of the session to ask. Um, sorry, it's, it's your call. So I'm moving on to the uh, second case, which is also dealing with media. Uh, so to complete uh, the loop. The sorry, Balaji, just a quick question before you move on to the second uh, case study. Um, so you mentioned you used uh, Google Trends, right? Uh, can mm -hmm. you highlight a little bit more on what kind of data that you look for in Google Trends? What kind of data helps you in assessing brand equity? So no, so Google Trend will not go any anything on this uh, uh, Brand equity. So it, it is just going to tell you the uh, the proportion of searches, right? So mm -hmm. uh, and they have an index, and then for each week, it is going to capture the the proportion of search terms, and then it's going to, for example, if you let's say PTM is going to be uh, the search which I'm going to give it today, um, you will see let's say it's going to be then have some percentage, it's going to be thirty percent or fifty percent, right? And then it's going, it's going to give you a time series to see. It's an index. Um, I don't probably uh, recall what exactly that index is about, but it's going to give you an index of the searches compared to all the other. And uh, just one last uh, question before I let you move on. Um, do you deal with the negative statements? Do you do some kind of sentiment analysis or things like that? What if the search query talks something negative about a brand and not positive. No, no. So no, no, the, the search query is just going to tell you how many times this search was done. That's it. It doesn't tell you what uh, what the statement was. I mean, it doesn't going to tell you, uh, I mean, what people are going to, it's not about what people are talking about the brand. Right. It just tells you the number of number of times people are searched for it. For example, so, if you Right. Like, so won't you, won't you get misleading indicators there? I mean, people might have talked good things about it or bad things about it, but when you measure brand equity kind of things, you want to know 
uh, yeah so for us it's 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 not about uh, so we are not using this uh, it, it's only a search term for example when you type let's say you're going to um, uh, buy a product say from mm-hmm. flipkart right you type the term flipkart on your google window you don't necessarily go and type flipkart dot uh, in right so when you just type flipkart that becomes a search that's one right and it's like what the proportion of what proportion of people have been typing flipkart on any particular day that's that's it that's all they're going to do so you may probably be want to read something about flipkart news that's still fine but this is what is being collected in this search so i agree with you on it's not uh, uh that's why when when we were doing it we are just using it as a proxy for us so we we look to the sales or the sales time series and we also look to the the search this the proportion of searches time series also right but doesn't go nothing yes. to do with the negative comments or positive comments okay thanks um balaji a quick question uh, so so these are uh, this is this is um, e-commerce company or this is a, a like you know regular off the shelf uh... uh, this is an e-commerce form yeah. okay 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 all right thanks okay yeah excuse me sir hmm. so so uh, the correlation of 75% that you said was between the google trends on the searches and the sales of the company right, right. so if we are uh, if we are having a 75% correlation in uh, like how venkatesher asked just now that the uh, sales wouldn't be uh, derived uh, driven by searches on a web page like typically google so right. it, it 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 need not be but in this case we found some correlation so there could be uh, there could be n number of reasons why this might have happened right and uh, we don't know why this might have happened but to use some sort of uh, proxy to since we don't have any other data if we if we want to do uh, identify the brand equity but we had zero data available with us and this was a a proxy that's it so we looked at the trend seems to be similar at some high correlation and then why not we use it and why they are correlated we don't have an idea uh, to say well, i don't have an answer to say okay sir. Can I move on? Yes, yes, yes. All right. So uh, the second phase, which I'm going to talk, is also still in this domain of media. Uh, so we were working for a uh, 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 leading whiskey brand in India, and this particular brand was uh, they had a budget of about seventy crores on media advertisements, and then TV and digital were the two larger platforms. Of those four. Nice one, and of which TV had a huge share, right? I'm sorry, what eighty three percent of uh, spends were towards uh, TV. Okay. And uh, when you look, when you see channels and digital, these are uh, usually your hot star, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and so on, really, because of the advertisement that you've seen on these, right? And when it comes to TV, and because we know on TV there are hundreds of channels. and uh, to uh, to to simplify then we looked at genres right genres meaning we looked at hindi movies english movies um uh, hindi uh, hindi movies and so on news sports so these are the genres we would group them into different genres and then the advertisement could be placed on either weekday weekend or it could be on prime time on prime time therefore where you have a huge set of combination of your um, uh, genres your time of day and time of week okay? and the day of week. so these so they were they were spending their money on all these different uh, uh, spots on both tv and digital so the, the with the background and then we came back to them asking what are the business questions they said first they wanted to know whether media is helping in driving sales okay? and i mean I, i already told you about the reason why people do media from this awareness up to uh, you say there's going to be a purchase right? and right the first question was whether it's going to drive uh, sales and then the next question was how do you measure it actually so if we can go back and tell them you know this is working or this is not working media is working or not but then there should be some analytical measure to go and say and this because of this particular number we're going to tell you this is not working and once we have this number then the obvious question was uh then how much do we spend on each channel and or each channel and then how do we optimize the future budgets right these are the set of questions which are client had 
and uh, and then when it comes to modeling, this these type of modeling falls under uh, our time series because you have your series, let's say you have your weekly or monthly series, and then you have your media spends, and you also know about uh, what is the price of this product across different months, and was there any promotion given, and of the distribution. And they say distribution is the number of shops in which the product is available, right? So more number of shops, your, your reach is going to be wider. And also some details on competition. For example, if there's a huge price cut in the competition, then you may see consumers switching from your brand to your competition. So with these kinds of, uh, these are the typical kinds of uh, time series data. And then it's also important to name up, remember, when they, so the question was, does media helping driving sales, right? But media alone doesn't uh, help in driving sales. Media, along with all these different uh, variables, your price, your distribution, and your uh, promotion and competition effects, that's what is going to drive sales. Right. So, so therefore, it, is, it has to be media and presence of all these. And how do we do it? I think there's a typical time series that you can do well, the standard time series, like vision of those, where you can do some nation models, or you have, let's say, you have this time series across different regions. Maybe you can all stack them up together and do some multi level type of, of analysis. So, these are standard practices um, one can do. But However, when it comes to media, right, it, 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 is a, it has to be treated in a different way. Uh, there has to be some kind of a transformation that has to be performed on media. And why is it so? Because it was, it's, it's a well-known fact that media, all these advertisements has lag effects and diminishing returns. For example, um, if you, again, let's speak, let me go back to this uh, PTM example, right? There was the, I mean, the ads about five, six years, Back, the ATM ads are quite popular. And then as the brand is new, you actually push a lot of uh, media so that people are aware of the brand and then sales slowly start to go up. And then after a certain point, people know about this particular brand. Even if you keep on doing advertisement, it's not actually going to uh, push your sales uh, significantly. And then that's when you're, you're diminishing points. That's it. It's like, it's like you know what? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know you as a brand exists, so please don't. I don't want to see your uh, ads anymore. So that's that's what this one is a diminishing point. And this particular media also has some kind of an ad stock or building up effect. For example, you see an ad today, you're not going to immediately go and, go and purchase or go and use that particular product. So there's going to be some significant amount of time before you convert into uh, purchasing this particular brand. Right? So there's going to be some. Uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, build up towards it. Right? So with all this in place, so media has to undergo some sort of a transformation. Now, there are various ways of uh, you can transform this media. I'm going to talk about this first particular one here, which is an extremely simple uh, uh, transformation. So now if AT is the advertisement, so when I say advertisement, it could be the spends, or it could be some other metric known as GRP or cross rating point. Uh, which is again uh, uh, collected uh, by different agencies. Let me, just let me not get into it for, the, for lack of time. Right? So now the transformation is uh, so your ad stock, which is nothing but a build up, right? Build up at time T is going to be, this depend on some proportion of your uh, amount you spent today at time T, and also it's going to be some, some proportion of your previous ad stock. This is they're going to build up some sort of a cumulative uh, effect. Now you can you can add you can keep on and you can uh, make your life more difficult. You can have some power function and exponential and so on. But let's let's stick to this to understand what this particular concept means. Right? It's it's a it's my it's a it's a prior weightage of the ad stock and then my and some weightage of my present uh, spend on TV. Right? <clears throat> so if you look at here, if you look at the, this chart, right? This blue Part chart is going to tell you. You can imagine them to be spins. I know I mentioned GRP here. For time being, you can imagine them to be spins, right? And then, so this is an. Um, let's say this is this kind of uh, uh, mathematical transformation used with a carrier of 0.2, and then the uh, parallelly, I'm also going to show something with a carrier of 0.7, right? So now, when you say carrier of 0.2, this means your brand should be on air continuously, right? Why? For example, look at this particular point here. So from March, there's a quick decay, right? It's a very sharp decline. 
and then because we have an advertise on april may and then probably by the time they advertise they're also spending less therefore the build up has declined but let's say if the particular brand has a larger carry over effect so now the decline is not going to be sharp so this is an this is going back and telling them you know you don't really have to be on air continuously maybe you can reduce your your uh, media budget or maybe even optimize to ensure you are in better spots right so this this is this is a kind of transformation one has to do with uh, media and uh, so the data what we had for analysis we had data for 3 years we should really have some monthly data set and here you have all this price distribution and then the 100 plus media mix means when i say media mix these are nothing but your tv genre combined with prime time on prime time tv and so on and ideally each of these media mix for example a sports uh, uh, let's say star sports or some sports genre a prime time and then uh, a weekend will have a different carry over effect right but to uh, make life easier we are going to focus on a simpler approach to uh, solve this problem so we thought of a two stage type of approach right um in the first stage we decided we will now get the overall media contribution so we will get the overall media impact on the volume sales that's going to be the first step and in the second step the second step you know the overall uh, uh, impact let's now split it into different media mix segments right so instead of putting everything together and then making the estimation to be really complex we're going to treat them into two different stages the first one uh you look at the overall and in the second one you uh, you're going to split the contribution into different uh bits of process media mix segment so now how do you get the overall uh, i mean uh, impact it's uh, again using some sort of uh, regression and we are using uh, this dynamic linear model now if so if so what what is the difference between this uh, simple regression and dynamic linear regression is in your dlm you let your variables or your, your impact of variables over time right in your standard uh, regression you don't do it you have them to be done or be done to be uh, fixed and then you when you estimate you'll get one value to it and over here they're going to let the beta to vary over time right and and using this we were able to get uh we we describe something known as a media contribution which is the impact of your your total tv digital and also some the uh, uh, the left over part in our second step um what we did we had to break down this as i said we had to break down this overall impact into small small pieces and to do this we use a partial least square technique in fact you can also do your your pca uh, type of approaches the results will be uh, similar okay. uh, i'm not again getting into what your your pieces and all is all about probably then you can ask savish we're all interested um so so this is this was our two step kind of approach which helped us to um get the impact of uh media for each of these different genres right so then once we have or once we once we have all these results we have to again go back and tell them uh to convey the convey our message so what did we find in fact if you if you first look at this particular chart on tv right so they were spending hello hello i think we have been going for action hello hello can you hear us yeah can you hear yeah 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 it's for for few minutes i mean few seconds probably you got froze okay. but yeah please go ahead yeah go ahead okay so now again this chart says the total investment which the uh, the company is to um this particular brand did and then this is going to this is a the there's nothing but the returns for the spend side so this this is from the model and this is just an empirical uh, representation of the spend side right so for tv we could go back and tell them you know reduce your budget on sports maybe improve increase, increase your budget on uh, hindi movies and then followed by hindi um uh, gc uh, which is your general entertainment chart and we could also go back and tell them your weekends are performing better compared to weekdays 
and then your prime time sports are performing better than your non prime time sports right so these are the recommendations which we give to the client and then they will go back to the drawing board and then next time they want to advertise they will keep all these in mind and then hopefully they would uh, uh, reduce the uh, the media budget on sports right and uh, similarly when it comes to digital we found digital on an average the returns were lower compared to tv and also in uh, digital the spends which they did were quite disproportionate so they had lot of investment into hotstar but the returns from hotstar were very very low so of course we had to go back and tell them cut your cut back your spends on hotstar and then increase your spends on facebook right so uh, these are the kind of analysis which uh, we did for this particular brand and although we had complex set of data we were able to uh, break them into a two state type of model and then we did uh, some of the solution right uh, i know i'm rushing through here um so which i have one more one more case study to cover do you think we have time or you want to uh, stop it here sorry we have about 10 minutes so you can adjust accordingly can i do okay then i'll i'll quickly uh, take you all through this particular uh, case sure now this case is very different from what i did the first two cases the first two was about uh, media uh, and the brand equity and so on so here this is it says it's very different there is nothing to do with media nothing to do with brand equity and we are working for a retail uh, retail firm and uh, this particular retail firm they were selling agricultural products right or agro products and they have some thousand plus retail outlets uh, serving farmers in south india this was easily about 6 years back so now the number of stores have uh, the number of retail outlets have become a very important uh, this particular firm and then what are the company wanted to know so they said we have we have a transaction data for what were three four years of transaction data and uh, we need to understand uh, certain things about what is going on in our uh, firm man of the consumers we wanted some sort of consumer profile they wanted to do some segmentation of uh, the consumers let's say for example a small medium large type of consumers in terms of the purchasing power right and then they had different categories they had uh, uh products on pesticides products on seeds and so on they want to understand which each how, how each of these categories are performing and what are the strategies which we can do it and then market basket which is quite popular but we have this picture is possible market market basket and and of course about customer churn and then how do you retain your farms or how do you retain the customers so to do all this we want we ask them what kind of data you have and then they said that we have what transaction data and of course the transaction data you had all the receipt uh, number the date of transaction time of transaction which village the farmer comes from because you had about they had about some i don't i mean 10 15 uh, villages and one particular store so they would make a note on which village the farmer comes from and of course a product id and this one here so this particular firm had this habit of entering customer name right for example if i'm going to buy a product and then the person the, the storekeeper is going to ask my name and is going to enter my name each time and that's going to be in english remember uh, these are all farmers who are talking about rural areas and then when you and then they're going to enter the name in english which is not their local uh, uh, language right then what is going to happen this is going to lead to lot of typos right and some spelling mistakes for for example my name balaji they could even uh, write with two ways p a a l j i or maybe sorry she instead of s o u we can take s a u and so on s a u r a s h so there is bound to be special and each time i go to the shop they going to do it it was not very technologically advanced they didn't have any kind of barcode which is going to track uh, the farmers who are purchasing from them uh, but it was a much more primitive type of uh, setting which they had right but end of the day even before we could do all those uh, market basket customer churn and all we had to understand who is buying right who are your customers so that was the first question which we had to answer even before we can go on to um, uh, customer profiling and retention strategies and so on right so when we look at the list of names right from all this transaction record i'm just going to share a sample out here so now this name yadaya it can it is in fact spelled in so many ways 
and you have initials you, and you have something here called ch so ch it's a it's, it's a title it's a form of respect it's chiranjeevi it's like a mr or a master or a mrs right and then you can have initials either front of name or after a name and then you have some special characters so this is just a sample is to say what possible ways in which people can record uh, the the consumer name so from this particular using this particular list as an example we will try to see how many customers are actually there for this particular uh, stock right so any 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 data modeling so you obviously start with some data cleaning so now we also had uh, our data cleaning to do and then we came up with some set of rules we had to follow all these rules sequentially before doing any type of modeling right and these set of rules we didn't we didn't come up like saying you know what we have to do this do step by step these step steps and so on this is after multiple multiple iterations right so we would do something and then we'll run the model we see an error we go back and then correct it so it may look like you know these are the set of rules which are come up with but it took us a lot of time for us to come up with the set of rules right it is it is it is purely because on I and mean, uh, of multiple uh, iterations right so now for now let's take this to be given so this is a set of rules we followed to clean the uh, names and therefore let's take the same set of data for this our dear friend yada ya we used this filtering exercise or cleaning exercise and we were able to bring them in some standard form or some standard template so uh, so these rules were followed to get all this data into one some particular template right that's what uh, uh, we did so then the next question is how do you know if these two names are same or not for example is saudish if you know spell this name with a o or a then you need to know if it's going to be the same person or not right so there are traditionally there are two main approaches to do it one is called a pattern matching and the other is known as a phonetic encoding so we first went ahead with this pattern pattern matching type of uh, 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 so what is that what do you have to do here now there are two strings right so two different names are taken as two different strings for example look at here this yadaya and then this is also pronounced as yadaya right and so how many characters you will have to uh remove from this particular name to get back this name right so now over here is going to be 3 right so when we saw this particular algorithm this known as levenstein set it is this known algorithm which we came up with it's a it's pretty old algorithm and uh, quite popular in uh, text mining uh, art thing so when we when we when we did this and then we realized you know what this we can uh, we will use this algorithm and then we will go with this as our rule so whenever you have uh, the difference between two names to be less than four we will say these two names are same right and then we thought good so we have the problem is now solved Unfortunately, this happened. So, let's example. There's a name Yadaya. Again, there's another name Malaya. Right? The uh, difference is uh, less than four, but these two names are clearly not same. Right? So, then what you have to introduce some sort of a phonetic, which is going to depend on the sound. Right? For example, if you make your uh, uh, Saudi English with S O, or let's say, for example, my name is Balaji B A A or B A, the pronunciation is still going to be same. so that's that's when we introduce this phonetic encoding and there is a very old algorithm called soundex algorithm which is this algorithm is uh, 100 years old yeah so sometime in 1910 or 12 well, that's when this uh, algorithm was uh, algorithm came up right so so for every uh, the character sound you have a code attached to it and i mean i'm not i'm not going to go through the set of uh, all these steps so for example for this soundex yadaya we will get this to be y3 number therefore over here this malaya is going to be some m some number and of course these two terms are very distinct and we can conclude say the two names are different right so we thought we have uh, uh, cracked it and then came another question so now which one should go first do you do this at a distance first or do you do this soundex first how do you go about it? Right. So this again, after some trial and error, we came up uh, with an approach saying uh, we 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 had this particular rule. We said if error distance is less than three, that should be a first uh, filtering approach, and the second filtering approach is done through the soundex algorithm. Right. So error distance layered on top of soundex. Right? That's 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 the final uh, 
algorithm that we proposed. And um, then, of course, using the same set of name as example, then we were at least on this list. It looks look like this one, two, and three. These three names are actually same names. So this is after the cleaning, which is step number one. And step number two is after the, uh, uh, the character difference. And then step number three is after using this, uh, the sound text of the phone, right? And using this, you were able to come up with the names which are similar. And then we also had to use more filters saying uh, which village uh, and so on, right? So, uh, and then you were able to go back and tell them these are your, in fact, you were able to identify the set of consumers. And then based on this set, you could down to your market basket, your customer retention, your customer churn and so on. So one of the major finding which we went back and conveyed to the client was the customer rate of churn was pretty high. It was about 65% on an average. In fact, for certain uh, stores, the customer churn was about 80%. So this is this is pretty high uh, numbers. And how do we define customer churn? Let's say if I'm a customer in, let's say I'm a customer of this particular store in 2019, and I didn't go and buy in 2020, which means I have churn. I'm not, the store has lost me as a customer. So uh, this was our uh, major um, finding. And of course, when you go and tell any particular firm that your, your churn rate is so high, uh, you're going to get some pushback. But this company was then, they had a separate study to investigate this really true. And then they came back to us and said, you know what, what number you should give as 65% was absolutely fine because that's what you're also seeing from a separate set of studies. Right? Uh, so I'm coming to an end of this particular uh, case and also my talk. Uh, I know the last two case studies probably I had to uh, rush through to cover it. Uh, so I hope I've given you a flavor of things, uh, what you can do in this marketing science. And this particular example was not necessarily in the field of marketing science. So uh, as a data scientist, you're probably going to get into all these exciting fields. Um, I hope you all have a, a great time being a data scientists. And all I want to uh, say is enjoy your journey. Yeah. So. That's it. So thank you. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Bala. Thank you very much. It was really nice talk. And uh, now uh, the floor is open for okay. question and answer. Uh, Venkatesh again, um, a quick remark and a quick question. Uh, I I'm sure some of the students must be jumping out of their chair when they heard of uh, Levinstein's distance and uh, phonetic uh, 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 sound X algorithm. Uh, we had discussed this at length in one of our uh, classes here. Um, okay, so uh, the question was um, to find the unique names. Uh, why didn't you take the machine learning route? Uh, why did you uh, choose sound X and uh, um, edit distance? Okay. I mean, we didn't. Uh, we didn't take the I mean, I don't have an answer to it. I don't know why we didn't do it because uh, I thought it was a, this was kind of simpler to do it. And what what is it, what is the idea that you are proposing? Um, I'm sure uh, these days, uh, uh, I mean, provided you have, I mean, you anyway need a, a golden set or a training set to know how good you are doing with your uh, unique. Right. So right. So so have, provided, yeah. yeah, provided uh, you have that, it must be fairly straightforward to have some deep learning. Right, uh, so method people have that, uh, I mean, I mean there's this a data with proper clean names or labels, we didn't have that. And that was one reason probably why we didn't have uh, And this, we did about uh, six, seven years back. I'm sorry, and, uh, was... and the literature we looked at, I think the uh, edit distance and from the is where the algorithm had commonly been done. We didn't, we didn't have any uh, label classes to start with. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Balaji. Thanks for the talk. So, Balaji, I have a question regarding the first case study. So, uh, uh, you once you get actually, I think I missed the uh, small part. When you once you get the um, like, uh, see, Google Trend Analytics for the competitor. Then how are you converting them into uh, brand uh, equity score index? Okay, so okay, so so we we, we have this Google Trend uh, search data for different brands in the category. So Correct. we had about seven brands in the category, and for each of these seven brands, we had uh, 
uh, the different scores on the, uh, the, the brand metrics, mm -hmm. your top of mind conservation usage and so on. Right, and then let's say it's a stack data. You do a simple regression, and then you you see the which of these band metrics are the, the important, and then what are the weightages that you have, right? So using those weightage, then we go back to the uh, the we go back to each brand and come up with a score, right? Because I know uh, what are the weightage. I know for each brand Wait. what the actual scores are. Weight you are training with the. Uh your client customer data? Say that again. So the weight that you are, that you are estimating uh, with your client customer data? No, the weight is estimated. Let's say the response variable was our Google Trends for all the different clients. Okay. And then the uh, the feature set, which are your covariates are nothing but you, we, we have this we see from brand survey. Yeah. Survey, yes. So. Yeah, so using so you regress y on this okay right therefore you get a weightage for the category right so you just can't have a separate weightage for different brands you okay. have one weightage for the category that's what we obtained from it obtained from this type of an exercise mm -hmm. and then you can compute the score for each of the different brands okay okay okay, okay? yeah yeah so, so anybody have any other questions it was nice talk actually so typically that i mean uh, in our data science classes i mean most of the time we do focus on a lot of uh, algorithms and math and statistical properties but uh, understanding the business cases and formulating into uh, a statistical problem or algorithm problem is actually a uh, real art. I think that uh, that you presented it really well. Thank you, Pala. Um, if uh, nobody has any other question, then I think uh, we can definitely give a round of applause in uh, but here it is not possible, probably. I don't know. We have a, a way of I know, giving round of applause. Do you have any question? Okay, then if we don't have any question, then um, I, again, I say thank you, Bala. And uh, I now uh, say that the session is closed now. Thank you. All right. So thank you. Thank you, Solution. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much.